What is up, heroes? This is Midnight Zero, and welcome back to Let's Play Professor Layton in the Curious Village Blind. In the last episode, we made our way through the decorator's house, and in this episode, we're gonna take a stab at the art lover's house. See what interesting puzzles we may have here. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm liking most of the puzzles, and I appreciate the challenge. This is surprisingly a midday recording session for me. My dog is out on a walk with a couple other family members, so the house should be quiet, and normally I like to get a lot of my work done early, or try to at least. Um, but, I don't know, I'm, I'm feeling some puzzles right now, it's the weekend, and, yeah, let's, uh, let's hop into them. We've got the Perimeter Perplexer, is what this one is called. Sounds pretty cool. Okay, so all you know about the plot of land below is what's written here. But even these few measurements offer you enough information to accurately calculate the plot's perimeter. Be careful when considering your answer. The diagram may not be proportionately accurate. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree. But, okay, so the, the goal is to calculate the perimeter, and we can obviously split this up into a bunch of rectangles. So that's going to be the, the goal here. Um, so what can we point out initially, right? Not a whole lot, admittedly. Um, the one thing I'm seeing is, well, that's not even entirely all that much. I'm thinking if we were to kind of drop this down as such, um, we might be able to get some important information. And I think part of what's also relevant is the them mentioning specifically that it's not proportionally accurate it means we can't really assume that this is a squared here, though it looks like it, right? So... Let's say, let's say this length here is x. Um, that'll be pretty important. Because then we know that this length down here that I just drew horizontally is going to be 5 minus x. Okay. And then... This is obviously um, 3 over on the right. Right? Which would make this entire length on the bottom 8 minus x. Which makes sense just looking at the, the diagram grossly. So now the other thing is going to be what are these vertical segments that we don't really know? They add up to five, and they look to be of equal length. We actually don't even need to know, do we? Because we're only looking for the perimeter, so we only need to know the sum of the vertical lengths anyways. So these vertical segments I'm drawing now, we know that their sum is five, right? And then importantly, this length here is 3, and then basically, oh, so I see, the x's basically cancel out, and then we're good to go. So, when you add up all of these sides together, you get 5 from up top, you get 5 going down this way, then you add 5, or then you add 8 minus x, but then again, you're going to add this x later, so that cancels out and you're at 8. Then you add the three vertical segments, which also equal 5, and then you add the 3, and you're good. So, now you actually need to just calculate that as I say it all, but... So it'd be 5 plus 5, which puts us at 10, and then 8, which will put us at 18. Actually, I should do this so I mark the sides off as I add them. So 5, 10, and then um, 18 crosses both of those out, and then 23 is those, and then 26. So I think the perimeter, which is what we're looking for, is 26. I feel pretty good about that. Because I don't think we relied on anything that was proportional, it was all just, just algebra. Alright, we did it, lovely. If you draw a line like the dotted yellow one shown below, you can see that the right side is 5 feet, therefore... Red lines X, Y, and Z must add up to the length of 5. Okay, yeah, so we pretty much got it. Awesome. 
It's one thing when it's like you solve it and then it's like you got it complete or you got it right for a completely wrong reason, right? <laughs> Alright, let's look at puzzle 128, number lock. Do give this puzzle a try. Give it a try, we will, Professor Layton. Okay. The door in front of you has an odd lock mounted on the front. The only way to unlock this strange contraption is to place small tiles labeled from 1 to 9 in its slots, and it looks like there are 7 slots. The lock will open when the numbers on the lock equal the same number when multiplied vertically and horizontally. There are 9 tiles, but the lock only has 7 slots, so you won't need 2 tiles. Interesting. I have not done a puzzle like this before, but it's like an odd take on the magic square um, principle, I guess. So, interestingly enough, um, we can't have too high of a number. It's actually, it's only vertically and horizontally, right? Yes. So, what's interesting, um, do they consider the middle tile a column as well? That's the big question I have right now. Because if so, we're probably going to want to um, make it a high number. However, it needs to be a number high enough... Well, so let's consider some factors here, right? Ooh, yeah, that's a good question. I'm, can I draw? I can't. Okay. Do they consider there to be three rows and three columns? Or is it there are three rows and two columns? Or is it there are two columns, there's two columns in one row? Yeah, I don't know. Do you guys see what I mean? So obviously it's drawn this H shape, right? Do they only consider the columns, the the, the columns that are, you know, connected? And do they consider the only row, the connected row in the middle? Or is it, am I trying to account for the top row and the bottom row as well? I don't know. The lock will open when the numbers on the lock equal the same number when multiplied vertically and horizontally. I think... So, one of the, my, my thought processes was, alright, let's see if we can figure this out. Um, in the very middle tile, there's no column, right? Meaning, whatever number is in the middle would have to be the equal to the total of the vertical products of the other columns, right? Um, so, is that possible? No, because um, the product of almost any three other numbers would be greater than any single digit number, right? Um, the only, actually, yeah, the only product involving, that would be single digit, but involves three individual numbers being multiplied together, would have to include one. And that's only possible to use, it's only possible to use that once. Meaning it couldn't be used for both columns, meaning if there were a single digit total we're trying to multiply up to, which would be the case if there were a third column moving vertically through that middle, um, space, um, it would be impossible. So, so that can't be the case. There can't be a third middle column. Um, and that makes me think that, that makes me think that there may not be a, you know, a second and third horizontal column either. So I think let's, that's what we'll start with. We'll assume we're only dealing with the connected columns. So the two demonstrated connected columns and then the one connected row. Now, this is going to be a product of three different numbers, and so we're going to want to choose the numbers that are intersecting with multiple rows and columns to be numbers that are the factors of many numbers. Um, you know, your, your even numbers, your, your 6, your 4, um, or your 8, for example. I feel like 6 and 8 will be particularly helpful. Um, Yeah. And of course, we want to keep the the product relatively low. 
So let's start by putting something like 8 there and 6 here. I think 48 is a relatively, is a pretty good number in terms of just the sheer number of factors it has. So what could we do? Um, I think 48 would be a good, good number, so putting 1 in the middle there might be good. Now, we need to make 6 between the remaining... Oh, actually, um, we're not... I don't think we're going to be able to do this. So if, if we need to make 6 on the left side, right, we would need to use a 2 and a 3. However, we then need to make an 8 on the right side, and we only have the 4 available, not the 2. So that would not work. So 48 would not be our total here. However, it also seems pretty evident that it couldn't be that much higher, I don't think. Um, and of course, 9, 7, and 5 are prime numbers, but we're going to have to use one of them. Well, I mean, also, so are 2 and 3, but but I guess 5, 7, and 9 are not very not as common um, factors of numbers. I guess you could consider this a type of least common multiple problem. Hmm. What else would be a good strategy? Starting off with something like 4 and 6 I think would be pretty good. I'm trying to think in terms of prime factorizations. So on the left we currently have, or I guess, yeah, on the left column we have two twos, right? And then on the right column we have a two and a three. So we're going to need to add at least one three on the left column, meaning we're going to need to add three or nine. And on the right side we're going to need to at least add one two, which would mean um, we're going to either need to add a two or an eight. And if we add an 8, we're adding three twos, meaning we would have four, four twos in total. And on the left, we wouldn't be able to match that with what we have available. So, so I don't think 8 is going to be used. And instead, I think we're going to need to add 2 on one side and 3 on the other. I'm going to do this for now. And so, with that, we're at, you know, 12 each. And again, we have two twos and a three on both sides. So now we look at the others. Oh, and I guess in the middle, we have two, we have three twos and a three. That's problematic, actually. Yeah, because that's one more two than what we have in the vertical columns. And so if we want the horizontal column to be equivalent um, hmm yeah that's not gonna that's not gonna work hmm I feel like the one is going to be in the center. That's just kind of the impression I'm getting. It almost seems like for the sake of symmetry. something like six maybe that could apply its factors of two and three to both sides hmm I guess something else we could do is start to think of products of three of these numbers, just to kind of get a better um, better idea of what numbers we're even really potentially working with, right? Um, obviously, there are nine numbers, and if we were looking for combinations of three of them, uh, that would be quite a few. I think it would be 
what, 9 factorial over 6 factorial, 3 factorial. So, 9 times 8 times 7 divided by 6, um, which would be 3 times 4 times 7. So, quite a bit, 84 of them. <laughs> so there, there will be a lot of different combinations. That doesn't rule out, actually, though. Um, or does it? No, it does, actually. Um, that does rule out similar orderings. Um, or different orderings of the same numbers. So I don't want to spend too much time doing it, but given that we need, you know, three different sets of three, uh, we can pretty quickly rule out some of the low products, right? So it's not going to be, um, it's not going to be like 6, 12, or 24, or whatever it may be. Um, it's going to have to be a somewhat higher number. Probably over a hundred, if I had to guess, honestly. What about like 120? That's a really nice number with a lot of factors. Yeah, that actually has a lot of different factors, manifests in quite a few different ways. The only ones it wouldn't would be 9 and 7, which I think would be fitting. Oh, I forget what these are, um... These are called, like, highly composite numbers. I think, like, it's actually... It might not be one. I know, like, 360 is one. I know 6 is one. I forget what the, what the term is, but it's, like, highly composite or, or something like that. When it has, like, a lot of factors. That's not the, the rigid <laughs> mathematical definition or anything, but... Alright, let's... Let's see, what combinations of 3 would get, a, get us to 120? So we could do something like 5 times 8 times 3, or we could do 5 times, um, times 4 times 6. That would work as well. Um, what else could we do? Hmm. So what I'm doing is I'm taking these and, and trying to kind of see where else I can add factors. And it looks like it might not might not happen. It might we might only have five times eight times three. Because like for example and five times four times six. Um, if we take five times four times six and say, okay, I want to make a new combination. Let's take one of the two factors in four and move it to one of the other numbers in that product then we either we're left with a 10 or a 12 neither of which is available to us so maybe 120 is actually too big we need a number small enough that allows us the flexibility to kind of move around the factors um, fluidly enough so what about something like 60 that is equal to 12 times 5, which is 3 times 4 times 5. That might not be flexible enough. <laughs> um, I get the impression 90 is going to be our answer now. Because it incorporates 9, and it is a multiple of 10, so it incorporates 5 as well. I feel like it'll just not incorporate... Um, yeah, 90 is, 90 is totally going to be it. <laughs> it'll probably just not incorporate... No, that could even work too. Yeah, um, it'll definitely incorporate, or won't incorporate 7, and probably not 8 as well, but we'll see. So 90 could be, what, it's 45 times 2, so 9 times 5 times 2. And then, of course, we can kind of shift around those factors, right? So 9 is 3 times 3, so we could have 3 times 5 times 6. Is that all? <laughs> Is that all? Did I just hype that up for no reason? So what I'm doing now is I, I wrote down all the numbers 1 through 9 just in terms of their factors. And I'm thinking it's got to be bigger than 120, but it can't quite be something like 360. Um, that's a little bit too high up there. 
just in terms of what what different combinations could I use. I could use something like 9 times 8 times 5, but as soon as I try to redistribute any of those factors, as in one of the 3s from the 9 or one of the 2s from the 8, any other number I give it to um, would become bigger than 9, meaning it's not available. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe something like 240 would be effective. It wouldn't include the 9, but it, I think it could include everything else. Maybe not, actually no, not the 7, not the 9 or the 7. But I think it would utilize some of those other numbers, those single digit numbers that have a lot of factors to shift around. So, so let's take a look at 240 then. 240 is 80 times 3 which is 8 times 10 times 3. Oof, already a rough start, guys. <laughs> um, so it would be 8 times 6 times 5, but that's also too high. That is also too high. But we already said 120 was not very effective. Maybe 180 would be the way then. It wouldn't really have 8 or 7 potentially to apply to it. But if it's 90 times 2, which is 9 times 10 times 2, we're going to need to split up that 10. So it would be 9 times 4 times 5. Now, could we move around much of this? Again, no, we couldn't. What am I missing? I basically need... I need a set of three numbers that, when multiplied together, give some sort of total, but then also have a sort of, have, have two degrees of freedom. Meaning, I can take one factor from one of those three numbers and give it to another number. Uh, I should, let's say you have three factors, A, B, and C, that multiply together to some total. I need to be able to take one factor from A and multiply it into B or C and have that new number, B times whatever that factor is, or C times whatever that factor is, um, be less than 10. So it's a still a single digit number. And I need to be able to do that twice. What does that mean? It means I need a number that I need a four. I need a 4, a 3, and a 6. I think those are the combinations I'm looking for. Yeah, because I basically need to have one of my factors, if multiplied by 2, not be bigger than 9, and one of the other factors, if multiplied by 3, not be bigger than 9, which means that two of my factors would be 4 and 3. And I want them to be as big as possible um, so that they have as many factors of their own. So let's look at this. 6 times 4 times 3 is equal to what? That's equal to 72. Now what I can do is I can redistribute the 6 is 2, for example, so that I have... Oh, wait. <laughs> that would be problematic because I'd be 3 times 8 times 3. So maybe that's not quite the degree of freedom I was hoping for. Um, however, if I were to take the 3, I would have 2 times 4 times 9. So we're close. Oh, <laughs> I forgot we can use 1. So then I could take another 2 and it would be 1 times 8 times 9. And that's our set of 3. So now the question is, how do we connect them? Well, looking at this, it's what? 6 times 4 times 3. Um, 1 times 8 times 9, 2 times 4 times 9, 3 is in 2 of them, 4 is in 2 of them, and then each of the other ones has unique numbers, right? And I can use how many times a specific number shows up in these combinations to decide which areas it needs to go in. Um, so. Any number that shows up in two of those three different combinations needs to be at one of the junctions. So one of those numbers is four, 
So we'll put four in one of the junctions. And then the other one is, what, nine. Which automatically would make this two. And then in the four, we would have six and three. And then in the other one, we would have eight and one, I believe. And so, unless I'm misunderstanding the rules and the horizontal rows that aren't directly connected, in this case, such as eight and three and one and six, need to also multiply to the same product, I think we have this right. Vertically on the left, we have eight times nine, which is 72. Horizontally across the middle, we have nine times two, which is 18, times four, which is also 72. And then vertically on the right, we have three times four, which is 12 times six, which gives us 72. And unsurprisingly, five and seven were left out. So I think this will fit. Let's give it a go. I think I've got it. All right. I did it. I'm pretty yes. proud of that one, actually. I, I like that puzzle a lot. And I feel like at, at first I had a, an idea of what we were aiming for and was kind of thinking of highly composite numbers that had a lot of factors. But what was the real breakthrough was the logic of needing that, that those degrees of freedom in moving factors from one number, one of the three numbers, to one of the other three numbers without it being, you know, a double digit number. And then thinking backwards in terms of, okay, what is the largest number I can do such that if multiplied by a factor from one of the other numbers, which had to be two or three, it's still less than 10. And that led me to the four and three. And then of course, um, the, the remaining number would have to be a number that can distribute those factors to something else. So it was either gonna be, you know, six, eight, or nine, um, but six is the most flexible. So I went with that first and surely enough, it, it worked out. So I'm really happy with the logic behind that. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. I knew you could do it. Aw, thanks for your confidence. All right, four balls. This puzzle requires your attention, my boy. Oh, we are paying plenty of attention. Attention? Attention. Oh! Oh, I like these. We'll see if I, I stay that way after this. I would say so far, I mean, I'll, I'll save judgments for favorite puzzles until we've, you know, completed them all. But, um... But these have definitely proven to be some of my favorites. This looks like a really unique twist, though, in that you're gonna have to move each ball to its respective color. Move each ball to the area with the same color. Do you have what it takes to complete the puzzle? <laughs> and again, I'm, you know, the, the symmetry here is striking, but... Okay, so... The symmetry, the symmetry. Um, it means we're probably gonna iterate a process, right? We need to find a way to get one ball to the other, um, and then we need to iterate that multiple times to get, you know, um, all four of them to their appropriate spots. They're also diametrically opposite from where they need to go which means we may need to shift them all one stage and then shift them all one stage again, rather than try to get one, you know, to its appropriate spot and then, you know, the next one. So regardless, our first move is almost always going to be the same. Um, we're opening up the, the floodgates for one of these, <laughs> um, one of these balls. So let's, let's start with this bottom left red one. So if we move this out of the way, um, the only, well, we have a couple different moves, right? We could slide this green one down. Um, oh, so we're like kind of consolidating all four of the individual open spaces so that we have a little bit more freedom. So if I did that, I think I'm actually gonna start with that. Then what I can do is I can bring this ball out like that so I can shift this all the way over. And now we're talking. <laughs> um, now, now what though? There are a couple potential moves that I'm considering here. So the first of which is, okay, do I move the, the green ball to the left so that I can slide the green bar all the way up? Or do I slide the yellow 
block up. The thing is, what does that do for me? Well, it actually, it actually does a considerable amount, doesn't it? And that's because after we move it, we can move the blue ball. I'm gonna try that. So we are now able to move the blue ball over here, which is going to enable us, well, I didn't actually need to do that yet, but um, I can then move this out of the way like so. So I can do that. And then what we can actually do is bring this up so that we have enough space to exchange here. And we already then have the, the blue ball in its appropriate spot. Now let's see if we can get the yellow ball to its appropriate spot. So we might actually just have to do this um, with each pair and then continue. So how do we want to basically undo those things? That is what we're trying to do, right? So let's move this up here. And again, we can move this down like so. I believe. Then we move this to the right. Shift this up there. Then down like so. Come on. Come down. I don't know why I wasn't moving. It's going to add needlessly to my move counter, which shouldn't really matter, but it's going to bug me. <laughs> And then we can shift this over, like so, to get the yellow ball in its appropriate spot. And now we need to repeat the process for the other one, for the other pair. And it actually should be the same process, I just need to reimagine um, what, it, what it was. So the first thing we did was we allowed the, the ball to come out in the first place. So I think we did that. Then we did something like this. Right? Or did we? <laughs> um, I don't entirely remember, admittedly. But we should be able to move everything in the same way. Why am I having a tough time picturing it now? Didn't I start by moving the red ball before? I'm trying to remember. I should go back and watch my footage. That's what I should do. But didn't I start by moving the red ball before? Either way, it doesn't seem fruitful now, at least. Um, so I think, yeah, we need to focus it this way rather than that way. So we'll do that so we can slide this in there. However, now we've run into a bit of a problem. No, we haven't. I just need to picture it appropriately. Okay. Man, I I don't know why, but I'm having such a tough time just picturing everywhere we need to put these and like turning it sideways. So now we basically need to undo what we did previously. So I'm gonna move this here, this like that, this like that. And then this over here, so I can shift this over like that. And then shift this back into the center, and we are home free. Whew! How does this sound? Again, due to the symmetry... Legends Apprentice saves the day! After doing the first one, I knew that I just needed to iterate the same process, but for some reason I was having a really tough time picturing it slash recalling what I did. This puzzle requires 28 moves to solve. Solving shouldn't be all that difficult if you stay focused and avoid getting confused. Yeah, that definitely felt like that. Um, 28 moves. I know that there were a few extraneous moves I made, but I was at like 47, which is quite a bit above 28. So that would be pretty cool to look into maybe on my own time. But regardless, we've, with that, we've cleared the art lover's house. And I would say that without a doubt, this has been my favorite house so far. <laughs>
Um, I actually really like these puzzles quite a bit. So, that was pretty neat. And next up is going to be, what, the Golden Apples house? How long have we been playing? It hasn't been too long, but I guess for what it's worth, it probably makes the most sense to, to call things here. So, in the next episode, we'll tackle the Golden Apples house. I actually, I, sorry guys, I'm curious, but I want to see a preview. Too many queens, five. Oh no! I'm so excited, I want to play that now. Or heavier or lighter, and then princess in a box, too. Oh, those look like they're going to be so fun. The block puzzles, the movement, the block sliding puzzles are fun. And the queens one was so fun, too. Oh man, I'm so excited for the Golden Apples house. I'm so excited. I, uh, yeah. I, I, I hope you guys are excited, too. I hope you guys enjoyed these ones. They were pretty cool. They were very mathematical. Um, they're very... Some of them were geometry focused. And, of course, the, the ball ones, I, I like those quite a bit. So, yeah, um, it was a good time. I hope you guys enjoyed watching them as well. Maybe offered some interesting perspective on it, or if you guys had other, you know, unique solutions uh, or ways of thinking about it. You know, sometimes I'm thinking in one way, and then the answer or solution they provide or explanation they provide is totally different. I'm like, oh, I guess that's another way to think about it. Um, if you guys have those types of things, please let me know, especially for these really challenging puzzles. But anyways, until the next episode, this is Moon Knight Zero, and this mission is complete.